and welcome back to a brand new episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Professor Kotlikoff, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Uh, good. Great to be back with you, Andrew. Yeah. A couple of years flies by and it's, you know, they always say this time it's different, but it's definitely been from the standpoint of tumultuous times. Uh, the last two years has been one that in, in my lifetime, I've really never seen. And, and I know you've seen some cycles, but just blows us away of what, what the news has been. Yeah, it's really, and then all these, you know, illness and deaths and, and uh, anxiety, it's just, it's really terrible times, no question, and it's just ongoing. And I, I feel for everybody who's lost people or, or has gotten sick from this. And every every time we feel like we're getting back to some normalcy, it's like, boom, something else happens. So, you know, we have to take it day by day. And and I know over the last year or so, you've been really busy and uh, that's exciting stuff going on with, with your end. So, uh, you know, we'll dig into, um, I think it's going to be your 20th book that's coming out here in January. Yeah, January 4th. It's called Money Magic, an Economist's uh, Secrets to More Money, Less Risk and a Better Life. So it's it's basically everything I've learned in like 35 years of working on personal finance. And, and today we're going to try to talk some high level on, on what's in the book and some of the things that we've utilized with our clients and uh, some of the core beliefs you have, which is you know helping to reduce risk of longevity, inflation. Um, now, we obviously, taxes are a big thing. But you know, we look. Your whole career has been spent uh, in the world of you know helping people make smart decisions, digging deeper analytically, looking at what the government can potentially do or what they are doing wrong. But when we think about like the last 30 plus years, when you were growing up as a, as a young boy and, and becoming in, into your uh, college years and so did you always know that this is your passion, that uh, numbers and the economy and, and really helping people, where, where did that come from? It come from it came from a frog actually. I discussed this in the uh, right of the first, in the intro de- in the intro to the to money magic. I was uh, intending to be a doctor, so I had to take biology, and in biology you have to dissect frogs. And in this case, I had to kill the frog, uh, kind of uh, give it a, some kind of put something on its heart, do open heart surgery, put some chemical in its heart to stop the heart and then rub the heart and resuscitate it. And I didn't have to do this once, I had to do this like 30 times in the lab. So the professor, you know, the instructor came over and said, great, now do it again. And then, you know, it was always like, great, kill the frog again and and (laughs) revive it. And uh, at the end of that class, I was an economist. I had switched majors, (laughs) I decided I was enjoying my economics course I knew nothing about economics. I just accidentally took this course, had a great professor. And it was from that point on, I was like sold on economics. Beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think from uh, going back to my year, I did not like that as well. And, uh, you know, the uh, in, in high school, having to go through on the biology and things of that nature. So um, why do you think they, on, on that end, why do you think we don't teach financial planning, budgeting, these things in in high school or even making a a prerequisite in college for everybody, it's just like, it blows my mind that this isn't built into the system. Yeah, you know, I've developed, as you know, this uh, financial planning software called Maxify.com, M-A-X-I-F-I.com. And we're now in our 29th year, uh, well, 28th will shortly be 29th year that we've been running the company. And the software is it's very simple, you know. You put in resources, earnings, assets, uh, things about retirement accounts, uh, Social Security. That's about it. And then the program cranks, and it says, "Okay, here's your sustainable living standard." And and it's like a, a simple tool that a high school kid could use. And I have approached high school teachers and said, "Look, we'll give this to you for free. Run it with your your math, you know, your math class. This thing is based on math. You know the." The, pre- the lifetime budget has to add up. You can't spend more than you have in resources. And the first thing you see when you run the program is a lifetime budget. Here's the present value of all the resources, you know, the wealth, the social security benefits, the withdrawals from the retirement accounts, the labor income, it's all in present value. Here's the present value of the off the top expenses, the taxes, the housing expenses. 
And the discretionary spending is what you get is the fund money. That's what we're solving for. And the program is just trying to smooth that out per year so that people's living standards don't fall off the cliff. They're, they can maintain their living standard per household member. That's, you know, completely simple. Any high school kid in a regular math class could, you know, with a little help of a professor could learn this in 10 seconds. And then they'd have a tool they could use the rest of the life. So yeah, I've been <laughs> pushing this with high school teachers, but they don't go for it for some reason. But why do, you, why do you think not? Is it just for them making a change or bringing something new is a risk that may in their mind go the wrong way? I think they have like a set curriculum and they don't want to necessarily go the extra mile of teach. but this is like a fun thing to do with the kids. And so if, if you're a, a parent, uh, who wants to teach their their kids some basics about uh, financial planning, grab the software and work it out with it. The kid will probably end up teaching you how to run the program. It takes like, you know, 20 minutes to input your results, look at the results and understand what it's doing. We have all kinds of videos, tra- you know, it's it's very simple, but the, and the, the, the book, Money Magic, is predicated on the things I've learned from running the software, not exclusively, and it's not a user guide to the software. I don't even really mention the this, this software. The editor said, you really can't talk about the software. I, I mentioned it in the preface. I mentioned it at the very end, like in a couple sentences, because what I, I know is that most people don't want to run software to plan their lives. They want to talk to a professional like you. Uh, or they just want to read a, you know, read about what to do, and that's what I said. Basically, I said I can explain to people uh, from everything I know about, you know, from running the program, but just in general about all kinds of topics, like divorce, for example. I talk about divorce. I talk about marrying for money. I talk about shacking up with mom. You know, lots of topics that are not exactly, you know, covered by the software uh, in the book. So the book is. Um, meant to shock people it's got all kinds of it's got you know probably 50 really strong financial shockers in there like you know if you got if you get older as you get older uh in retirement should you be investing more in stock out of your financial assets turns out that's a standard result in in in, uh, economics of finance nobody would think that as you get older you should be investing more and more heavily in stock. Why would that be? The reason is that you're trying to maintain a balanced portfolio. So as you get older, your your assets, your total assets, your regular assets, your like your, you know, your your brokerage account, you're spending it down. But your social security benefits are not declining, right? So you're becoming more of your total assets, re- resources are invested in things like bond, you know, social security is basically a bond. It's a stream that's for sure. It's it's a real bond because it's an inflation indexed. So you're through time, as you're working down your assets, as you're spending down your assets, uh, your brokerage account, you're becoming more and more invested in bonds. So to maintain a balance, you want to take that smaller amount of of your brokerage account and put more of it into stock because that maintains more of a stock to bond ratio, more of a constant ratio by doing that. So it's the share that should be invested more in stock. The absolute amount is uh, not necessarily going up, it's going down, but the share goes up. And and that kind of puts everything on its head there. You know, we look at the whole mantra is as we get closer to retirement and then in retirement, it's lessened the, the the amount of risk that you have in the portfolio. So what would you say to somebody on that end, especially, you know, we can never time the markets, but we've had a, a 10, 12 year run. We know we're um, at some point going to see a, a market correction of risk assets, whatever the reason may be, and not just as short lived as we saw last March and April. So what would you say to somebody there who um, would, you know, the, the typical financial planning side of it, which is let's lessen some of the risk. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd say um, on the timing, you know, you just said we shouldn't time the market. And one of the financial shockers in the book is that it says that we should time the market. And what I say in the book is that we should time the market, not for return, because the market is evolving as a random walk. The return on stocks is based up. Uh, 
on new news that comes in. If if everybody if if people knew something, they would already have used that in uh, investing, and the stock price would re already reflect that information. So it's only new information, which by definition, if something's new, it's you you can't predict it. It's unpredictable. So that's why stock returns evolve as a random walk. And I try and make that clear because there was a book written by Bert Mer Malkiel about a random walk down Wall Street. I looked at Bert's book and I didn't think it really fully explained why stocks should evolve as a random walk. And that's the basis for people saying you can't time the market because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you can't say, well, the stock stocks are low and therefore they're going to go back up because that's not connected with a random walk. A random walk says that they're low, they could be lower tomorrow. They could, there's nothing that says they're gonna go back up. Stocks are not safe in the long run. That's that's another financial shocker really relative to received wisdom. But why should we time the market? Why am I saying we should time the market if I'm also saying that stocks are evolving as a random walk? It's because we should be timing the market for risk. Risk is not constant through time. And as things get riskier, as COVID, for example, we have now have this Omni, uh, Omni, Omicron or whatever it's called uh, variant. That's, and you know the market is dropping. People are pulling out. So they are timing the market and they're doing it properly because the environment is riskier. We don't know what this, what this thing is going to mean. And so when, when if you're, uh, you know, if things are riskier, and since we're risk averse, averse to risk, we don't want to hold as much in risky assets when things are riskier, when times are riskier. So we should time the market not for return, but for risk. So that's another one of these kind of sh financial shockers. There's like, you know, 50 of them in the book. Uh, if I just tell you, you should time the market, I'm an economist and I work in finance as well as personal finance. And, uh, you might say, well, this guy's nuts. Finance says not to time the market. And it does. It doesn't, it says don't time the market for return, but it does say time the market for risk. And this is something that people that economists have not pushed with the public. So um, you know, one of the guys endorsing the book is Bob Merton. Why he's got a blurb uh, that says this is, you know, says fantastic things about the book. Now, Bob Merton is like the Isaac Newton of finance. He's got a Nobel Prize for his work in finance. So having Bob Mer Merton, Robert Merton endorse the book is like having, you know, the economic gods bless the book. It doesn't get better than that. Um, so what I, you know, <laughs> he read through it very carefully. He, he blessed everything I wrote. So, uh, I'm uh, I'm saying things are consistent with uh, what the top finance economists in the in the world are are thinking or saying in their work. And you know, before we jump into to more of the the topics that I think a lot of our listeners are are interested in, and some of the you know your core beliefs on social security and how complex it is, but some of the strategies we should look at. Um, while I while I have you on, you know, I, I'd be remiss that we don't talk a little bit about where we are economically, right? The um, inflation fears, supply chain, the money supply, you know, things that you've been talking about. And I think this, you know, four times, 10 times over the last 18 months. So thought process there, you know, we're seeing inflation obviously hitting a lot of different factors, dinners, travel, the big ones that a lot of us face. Uh, where, where do you see things going right now with uh, the money supply and inflation? And are we going to be able to you know, wrap our heads around this? Or is there going to be something like the 70s where we have stagflation, where my generation hasn't dealt with that before? Yeah. Well, um, you know, there was this economist named Milton Friedman. I don't know if you if that name uh, rings a bell. He got the Nobel Prize and he was of the view that um, if you look at the government's printing of money, uh, what's called its base money, uh, there's a relationship through time between the price level and uh, the stock and the amount of money that's been printed. But um, uh, I, you know, what Friedman I think missed is that uh, a lot of the printing of money uh, that the Fed is engaged in, and it's increased the base, what's called the base money, 
the base money supply by a factor of six since 2008. We've got six times more money having been printed now than we had in 2008. And that's been, of course, to, but a lot of what that increase in the base money is about is the Fed will go buy a security. So maybe it'll go print money up and it might buy, just for an example, uh, General Motors stock, okay? Maybe it's trying to, uh, or a bond, not, not so much stock because the Fed is not investing really in stock. Uh, but but bonds. I mean, sometimes it does invest in stock, it, um, but uh, mostly it's it's bonds. So it buys up General Motors bonds, and then it might say, well, you know, I've, somebody would say, well, that's inflationary. It's it's printed up more green belt dollar bills, and bought up these certificates. But the Fed might say in response that, well, look, in two years, what we're going to do is take those shares of stock, and um, and uh, and sell them into the market and pull the dollar bills out from the, uh, the economy. So we're not actually through time increasing the total stock of money. We're temporarily increasing the stock of money, but not through time. Now that's, why am I telling you this? When I'm telling you this is, I'm saying this is because we, we don't know for sure if the Fed will do that, we'll be able to reverse the printing of money. But we do know so we can't say how much uh, uh, the Fed's behavior is inflationary or not. What we do know from looking at other countries like Argentina, like the 22 countries that ran hyperinflations in the last century, is that countries that are fiscally insolvent, are in trouble fiscally speaking, have a long-term trajectory of projected spending uh, that is much larger than their proje project projection of uh, receipts of taxes. If they look like they're in fiscal trouble, like our country does, our country looks in terrible fiscal shape long term. If you look at uh, the difference between the projected uh, outflow and the projected revenues, it's about 8% of GDP every year forever. It's enormous. And most of the liabilities, obligations are off the books, like my social security benefits that I'm now receiving since I'm over 70, that's an obligation that your generation and your kids, my kids have to, uh, to pay. That's not on the books as, a, as an official debt. So if you put, if you say, let's put everything on the books, whether or not it's called official or unofficial, put it all in the books. It's 8% of GDP forever that we're short. Countries that are short, that kind of, amount of money uh, tend to print money to pay these bills, to make up the difference. They tend to generate inflation. So I can't say for sure that that the Fed's behavior is uh, really trying to print money to pay for Uncle Sam's bills, but every other country that's in this kind of fiscal shape historically, prints, you know, the first thing they do is they put pressure on the on the central bank to print money to pay to deal with uh, not raising taxes. So I do think that we have a long term inflation problem, I, enormous one. And I do think that people should be very wary of buying long term bonds because they're yielding uh, a return that's predicated on the assumption that inflation is going to be 2.25 percent as of today's market, roughly. And that's just nuts. I mean, we're running 6 percent inflation this right now. Why should it go back to 2.25% when the country's so broke? I mean, we've got, you know, <laughs> members of Congress who don't have an iota of a background in economics, and uh, they just want to get themselves reelected. We've seen uh, the political nature of uh, their decision making. So some president's going to come along and, and grab a, a compliant Federal Reserve chairman who will not buy bonds in order to, or, uh, to, uh, to temporarily you know, hold bonds and then sell the bonds back in the market and withdraw all the money and keep the money supply over time, some sense stable, but rather just to, you know, the, the buy, the, the treasury will print bonds in order to, buy, to get some money to buy gas for Air Force One 
And so, and then the bonds that they pr they sold into the market, the treasury bonds, the Fed will buy, and we will just have, if you look, put it all together, we'll just have the Fed printing money to buy the gas, air, the uh, airplane fuel for Air Force One. And that will be kind of the way it goes. So now the public, because things are complicated, and we don't know how the Fed's going to behave through time. Uh, the, the public has to kind of guess what inflation is going to be. And then their guessing can be, we think it's going to be very high. So expectations can play a huge role here. Right now, we're, we're seeing 6% inflation. The market's expecting 2.25% inflation in terms of the returns long term. But those expectations could turn on a dime. And uh, people could start to really realize how broke the country is and how much money will likely be printed to pay for the Air Force One fuel. And that could lead to uh, everybody expecting 6% inflation for the long term. In that case, if you're holding bonds that are yielding 2.2%, you're going to take a huge loss. So I'd be very careful about inflation, very careful about holding bonds. I'd be very um, concerned about um, uh, any, uh, if I have a pension, for example, that's uh, nominal, that's not inflation indexed, an annuity that's not inflation indexed, uh, we're, I'd be con very concerned that, that inflation is going to water down my income in, through time. Uh, and we have a lot of people still on pensions that are nominal, uh, like, you know, Detroit fire workers, uh, fire, firemen who, uh, and women who uh, got a bad settlement as a result of Detroit going broke. Well, they got a nominal pension. They got like 40 cents on the dollar if I got it right, and it's fixed in nominal terms. Well, if inflation 6% for five years, they're going to be wiped out. So how can you protect yourself? One of the things I talk about in the book is um, if you take out a bigger mortgage, since rates are still low, you'll be able to... Uh, pay back the mortgage and water down dollars if inflation takes off. So a mortgage can be a natural hedge against inflation. Any nominal liability that you have to pay off, uh, if the interest rate's not too high, it might be a good infl inflation hedge. Yeah, we and we have those co conversations with clients all the time. It's, you know, do we pay off the mortgage? And then, you know, right now, some people are sitting at two and a half percent. So it, yes, a psycho psychological, I have no debt, but we explained if your house rich and cash poor and that cash, which has ultimately, well, risk is in theory, yes, there's no risk, but there's inflation risk, et cetera, opportunity cost. But if they yeah. can make 6% in a money market. So those are the type of conversations that I think you know everyone needs to have. Now, if they're sitting at, at a 6% mortgage and you can do the math, and of course it makes sense to, to work to pay it down. You know, The one thing you, you know, mentioned with the debt and the GDP, you know, at some point, like the 10 year treasury now with it being at 1.42 right now, and it's been fluctuating, but at some point, right, it has to give, you know, the yes, the Fed can keep rates low, but at some point, that is when we look at treasuries, one of the, you know, people don't realize it is a very volatile asset. And if you look at it historically, it's sometimes more volatile than even equities when you look at the volatility that, that can be there. So do you think that that's going to be something that we're not really bringing into the equation now? Because um, obviously, the the government's refinancing pretty cheap, just like we are in the in in our housing. Uh, but what happens if that turns? If the market says, you know what, we need more for the risk we're taking. Yeah, and I think everybody should re demand more, and, and therefore stay away from ten year bonds, stay away from thirty year for sure, tre thirty year treasuries. Yeah, because people are not aware, um, Andrew, of how broke the country is fiscally. I mean, I, I, it all comes back to that. If you could. Um, you know, ultimately, if you can pay for what the government's spending by using taxes, uh, then you don't have to print money to pay for the government's bills. But if the country's got Social Security, you know, the Social Security trustees report came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe it was a couple of months at this point, where it's, it's showing a $59 trillion unfunded liability. The official debt is $22 trillion. Okay, think about this. The trustees of Social Security have a report in Table 6F1 tucked way in the back of the uh, the appendix of this 
annual trustees report. They don't talk about it. The trustees don't mention it at all in this, at the beginning of the, of the report in talking about the condition of Social Security, its financial condition. But then if you look at its long-term unfunded liability, this is the present value of all the outlays projected by the actuaries of Social Security versus the present value of all the tax receipts uh, that are you know, going to come in. $59 trillion short, that's two and a half years of GDP. That's just Social Security. You add that to the official debt, which is one year's GDP. Now we're talking about three and a half years of GDP. Well, you know, Italy's official debt is uh, about two years, of, one and a half years, two years of GDP. Uh, but they're the official debt. So that's much higher than our official debt, which is one year's of, of GDP. But their unofficial debt is much smaller. So Italy actually is in better long term fiscal shape. And we are, I said that we're short about 8% of GDP forever. And just to be clear, Social Security benefits are roughly about uh, 5% of GDP, four and a half. Per, so we're talking about two Social Security, you know, one and a half, two, two, two Social Security programs. That's how big 8% of GDP is. Okay, so it's not a, a small thing. Italy, it's about, they're short about one and a half percent of GDP. So the same calculation has been made for the European uh, Union members and for the U.S. It, but in the European Union, the government actually, the European uh, Council actually does it. In the U.S., I do it. OK, so I'm the only one probably in the country. Uh, well, there's a couple other economists, Alan Auerbach uh, at uh, Berkeley, for example, uh, also does these kinds of calculations, sometimes with me, sometimes uh with other colleagues at, at Brookings, but there's only a handful of people that are focused on our fiscal gap and it's enormous. So yeah, we gotta be really careful about <laughs> inflation and under, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, the economy has done much better than I would have expected given COVID. Uh, we have adapted very well. The Fed has come in to kind of rescue the market, uh, but, uh, you know, as uh, inflation, if inflation does take off, which if people's expectations, if people are, you know, if everybody in the country were to listen to this podcast, I think the 10 year rate would change this, you know, in 10 seconds, you know, when the market's open today. Well, that's a lot of pressure you're putting on uh, my list. <laughs> but no, it, it's... Um... It, 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 not to be, you know, this isn't depressing talk. It's reality, right? It's what's kind of not um, brought out to the attention of the masses. A lot of people don't understand it, but um, what uh, what would you do to fix it? Is it fixable, right? Because you're sitting, you know, the, what you're telling us is a, a very difficult story to comprehend. And it's like, in some people's mind, does that mean the the end of our empire is, is it upon us? If and I know you ran. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but in 2012 and 2016, you did run uh, for the presidency. What what is it that you think can be done to salvage where we are today for the next generation and the next just, generation? Just to be clear, I, I ran as a write-in candidate, and I was running, uh, particularly in 2016, uh, in order to explain what economists would do if what economists think we should do. So I thought, gee, I'll write a platform, and uh, the press will take uh, my views, which were really the views of most economists, because I was try trying to ask economists what they would do uh, before I wrote the, my platform. So I talked to tons of people in, the, in my field. And uh, so I wrote this platform. And then once I, you know, Trump was elected, I, I wrote a, I turned it into a book called You're Hired. Not You're Fired, but You're Hired. And it's on my website at kotlikoff.net. And anybody can download it for free. So it says exactly what I would do, how I would fix Social Security, what I would do would be, look, the thing is broke. Uh, just, you know, when all these corporate pension funds were broke, what did they do? They froze them, they paid off what they owed, and they set up defined contribution plans. So they got out of the defined benefits um, business and went into the defined contribution system. So that's what I'm proposing for Social Security. How would I fix uh Healthcare, I would put everybody into Medicare Part C, which is uh, the version of Medicare that the Republicans have developed 
which involves competition between you join a uh, you get a voucher which um, uh, to join a healthcare plan and the size of the voucher, which is basically your ticket to get into that plan that you give to that uh, uh, health insurance company that you're gonna choose every year, it's bigger if you've got diabetes, if it's based on your pre-existing conditions so that the healthcare company is not going to be interested in discriminating against you because they know that if, you, that if you're sick, they can make money on you because you're you're bringing them a bigger premium and it's being paid for by the government the government is going to experience rate you well no uh, well actually evaluate you based on your pre-existing conditions give you a voucher if you've got diabetes you might get a voucher as twice as big as somebody who doesn't so now you so the insurance companies will immediately see that they can make money off of everybody and that this eliminates immediately the problem of cherry picking which has plagued this industry from the beginning. That's the key problem. So as economists, we have been studying why the health insurance market doesn't work like the apples market or the wheat market. It's cherry picking. So, and it's because uh, the insurance company doesn't know if I've got diabetes necessarily. But now we have, if we make this information public and we compensate people with bad information with a bigger voucher, now you've got everybody on an even playing field. Now we've got the health insurance market transformed into the wheat market. We can have total, you know, incredible competition. We can have health insurance for all. So we can get what Bernie Sanders wants efficiently with competition and get our country from paying 18% of GDP on healthcare down to about 15, 12%, somewhere in there, like the Europeans are paying. 12% is what the Swiss, the, the French, the Germans are paying out of GDP, not 18%. That's driving us broke. So unless we get that fixed, if we can bring that from 18 down to 12, that's six percentage points of the eight percentage point problem that we've got, right? So, and and fixing Social Security is going to uh, save a bunch of money. And and what else can we fix? Well, we can fix the banking system in a real in a manner so that we never have uh, another uh, 2008. Uh, I mean, I could go on to discuss, I, I tried to discuss every, uh, uh, how to fix the tax system. So we actually get the rich to pay their, the super rich pay no taxes. They just borrow, they've got their assets in stocks and things that are appreciating. They never sell things uh, because they don't wanna pay capital gains taxes. They just borrow at low rates uh, to pay for their yachts and everything else. And then they leave their, their uh, appreciated assets to their kids with what's called a step up in basis, you know all about that. So the kids don't have to pay tax, that capital gains tax uh, is not, is being avoided. So this is terrible. What we should be doing is taxing uh, the consumption of rich people. Uh, it's very easy to, to do this kind of a calculation uh, to, to, ta to, uh, to introduce a progressive, what I call cash flow consumption tax. So I have a very, you know, I think straightforward a tax ref well it's not <laughs> it's straightforward it's very every one of the proposals has got like 10 bullets that's it okay very very simple how to fix banking social security education healthcare taxes uh, and so people should you know if they're interested in policy download uh, you're hired yep and we'll have it we'll have it in the show notes listeners um, so, so you, we talked to, on social security, right? It's in trouble in that 59 trillion, that number, um, yep. you know, that I've never heard that just gas, you know, of, of, uh, of, you can't even fathom it. So, so then we know it's in trouble. Okay. And, and, and you're a, a big firm believer. And, you know, over the years I've used this book to get my team well-versed because we do believe Social Security is that core piece of that foundational, in a sure. sense, guaranteed income. So you've always been a believer, and we'll we'll talk about this now in in regards to how do we utilize those that that are taking or close to getting their benefit. What's the best means to do it? And obviously, you've spent many years helping through your different contributions with Forbes and PBS and your book, and just having people understand that yes, this is very complex. It's more complex than than you said than the tax code, but before we jump into your thoughts as to how to utilize it the best way, if, and we get this a lot, well, if it's not going to be there, right, why shouldn't I take it then at 62? 
you know, we know that that's a very bad financial mistake when we look at, you know, using your software or, or so forth. But what can we tell somebody then if we're saying that this system is broken? Well, then why should we push to have them delay as long as possible? Okay, so a couple of things. I want to be, be clear is that, you know, I have these proposals for how to fix Social Security. Uh, but when it comes to actually advising people uh, in my book, Money Magic, or in the book, Get What's Yours, that I, that I co-authored with them. Um, to uh, two buddies, um, uh, I'm trying to say, look, I'm not president. I'm not going to be president. I don't think. I, I maybe, maybe I didn't win because I was too young. Could be. Uh, maybe next time around, I'll, if I run, I'll get elected. I'll be at the right age uh, or closer to the right age to become president these days. But uh, we have to, you know, when it comes to actually advising or suggesting to people what they should do, we have to look at the reality of you know, the politics of uh, our political system. And uh, uh, and I don't think that members of Congress will ever cut Social Security benefits directly. I think what they're going to do is uh, tax uh, them at a higher rate, uh, which is going to differentially affect richer people. And I, uh, and I think they will uh, perhaps use general revenues, come up with other ways to pay benefits to cover the, the uh, shortfall. But even if they did cut Social Security benefits, let's say by 25% starting in 2031 when the system's cash flows go negative, uh, which, which I think is just politically uh, suicidal. So I don't think that's going to happen. But even if they did, it would still behoove people to wait till 70 to take their retirement benefit because their benefit is going to be cut either way. If they take the benefit early at 62, it's still going to be cut uh, in the future. And if they take it at 70, it's going to be cut in the future. So the differential, the gain from waiting will be smaller, but it'll still be enormous. Uh, it's astronomical right now. Uh, for most people, I'm not saying that everybody should wait till 70. If Obviously, if you're single and your maximum age of life is, you know, you have prostate cancer, you're only going to possibly live for a couple of years. Uh, you should take your benefit right away. But if you're, let's say, 68 and have pot prostate cancer and you have a spouse and maybe a couple ex-spouses who are going to collect widow's benefits on you, uh, you want to wait because you'll be able to raise their uh, survivor benefits and, and <clears throat> divorce uh, widow's benefits by 16%. So it is very, you know, it's very much dependent on your circumstance, and and uh, you need to know, you know, what's in that book. Uh, but in an encapsulated, you know, in in Money Magic, I I point out kind of the ten secrets to uh, getting the most Social Security benefits. I try and you know uh, uh, reduce that whole book to ten uh, to one chapter, ten secrets to try and make it, uh, to get the most important things across to people. Like they should not get, you know, get scammed by social security. Uh, social security is running several different ki kinds of scams. Uh, they're scamming widows, uh, getting them to lose uh, lifetime benefits. Uh, the, their inspector general came out and said that social security has been scamming, has scammed in recent years, 13,000 widows to the tune of 130,000, 130, 000, 130 million dollars. And uh, at least under Trump, this was not addressed. Now, I don't know whether under Biden, uh, Social Security will go back and fix this, but the Inspector General of Social Security said Social Security needs to go back and, and look at all the cases where they scam people. And I could explain the scam if you want, but... Um, and is that is the scam just in regards to not fully educating them about how the widow benefit works and how they could potentially take their benefit and delay the widow benefit or vice versa? It's just exactly. more of hey, take your widow benefit in, in, at sixty, and then they're stuck with that lower amount. Well, it's a little quite a little bit different. It's more like you know people who are sixty two where who just became widowed, and they uh, they had them take both their widow and their uh, retirement benefit at the same time which they didn't have to do. And consequently, uh, they weren't able to just take their widow's benefit and then let their uh, retirement benefit grow by 76% to, uh, 
to age 70 and then switch from their widow's benefit at 70 to their retirement benefit, which would have been 76% higher. So imagine your retirement benefit's just a dollar below your widow's benefit, your early retirement benefit at age 62 is a dollar below your widow's benefit at available at age 62. So if you check off what they, what Social Security did is had them check off the box to take both benefits and they just got their widow's benefit for the rest of their life, their lives, instead of not checking off that box on that form and waiting till 70 and then having their benefit, their check basically go up by 76% for the rest of their life from 70 till 100. So that's, that's a scam. Another, you know, there's several, a couple scams that they're running and they're discussed in this book, Money Magic. You got to avoid them because this is a, a dishonest agency, basically. I've been writing about this. I've been using the word scam in Forbes and Columns and it's not being addressed uh, by members of Congress. So we just have to be careful on our own to make sure we don't fall into this trap. Yeah, and we see it even in, in our industry, in uh, you know, financial planners and CPAs, they they don't really understand the rules and they're not guiding their clients in, into making those good decisions. And we look at it as, you know, the amount of money that was put into the system and the amount that they should, based on, you know, a, a normal life expectancy, how much they'll be getting back out. It's not a decision that should take 15 minutes, which a lot of people do. And on your point, we've had using software like yours, um, we've gone with clients and said, this is the strategy, right? Based on X, Y, and Z. And they'll go into the social security department when you, when you could before COVID. And literally they'd have to call us because they were told, no, they couldn't do this. And we had to actually get a manager a type of, of individual to, um, to walk through this and say, no, this is the rules, right? So if that's happening, when we're giving the guidance, imagine when they don't have somebody that's helping them through or, or reading your book or, or your contributions, it's pretty scary. Yeah, I, Social Security, you do not want to ask Social Security any questions because at least half the time they will tell you something that's 100% wrong, that's incomplete or misleading. Uh, and that will lead you down the wrong path. Or they will actually do, you know, without your consent, they will check that box, for example, if you're a widow. Some of these cases, these 13,000 cases where people were, were some staff who didn't know what they were doing, they checked the box for the person and said, well, surely you want to apply for all your benefits right now that are available. No, you don't want to apply for all your benefits that are available. <laughs> you absolutely don't. Uh, you want to apply for one or the other, but not both at the same time. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, you, we, you need um, help. And that's where you guys or my books or whatever, uh, our software can, can really uh, rescue things. And, and the, you know, the, uh, the 8% increase each year up until age 70, um, you know, people come in and they just try to spreadsheet it out and they look at it as, okay, here's my break even point, but they're, they're not taking account what we believe is so many factors, right? If they're married or they've been divorced or, you know, ex-spousal, it's how are we protecting the surviving spouse? Um, that's a big piece because you know, a lot of them don't understand they're going to get the higher of the two. But then also right now with the cost of living, and we haven't seen this in, in many years, it's been averaging sometimes zero. And, and now we're finally getting that increase at 5.9. Doesn't mean that they have more money in their pocket, right? Because of the cost of everything else, but it means they're helping to keep up with that cost of living that that is more expensive. Um, yes, yeah, given are, the risk of inflation we're talking, you know, we've been talking about, you want to have more and more of your resources in inflation protected uh, form. And that's another reason uh, for a very strong reason for being patient, because uh, as your patient, uh, your benefits going to be higher. And that means that a bigger share of your resources, your lifetime remaining lifetime resources will be inflation protected. But let me just say one thing about kind of break even and life expectancy economics says, and this is, you know, we discussed this in, in money magic that, uh, uh, we really have to plan for our maximum age of life. Even It may seem crazy. I, I, I should be planning to live to 100. That's my maximum age of life, let's suppose. Uh, I, nobody in my family lived to 100. Uh, uh, well, here's the, here's the reason you have to plan to 100. It's because you might live that long. And if you do live that long and you plan to die on time at your life expectancy, 
which is like 20 years before you, 100 or 20, maybe 15 years, you'll be living on cat food. So what, what economics says is you have to plan to your maximum age of life. Uh, that's your planning horizon. But if you, since you know that you're not likely to make it to 100, what you do is you have, you arrange your uh, spending so that your living standard gradually declines, maybe starting at age 80, maybe it declines a half a percent a year. So that's how you arrange your finances to spend more when you're young and plan to spend less when you're old, but not to have a plan that kind of ends when you're supposed to die because you're not going to die when you're supposed to die. Nobody does. We either die too early, you know, early, earlier or late. I mean, my, my mom lived till 98 when she was 88. I went, you know, I told my brother and sister, you know, mom's 88 and uh, we should buy her an annuity. And at that point you could buy an inflation indexed annuity from the principal insurance company. And they said, uh, my brother's the provost at Cornell. He won't like me telling him this story. Okay. My sister ran major, some major corporations. Uh, she won't like the story, but they'll forgive me. So, so I, to, I said to them, look, we have to buy her an annuity. They said, you're crazy. She's 88. She, she's on great health. She's only going to live for, you know, at most four years. That's what the life expectancy tables say. I say, no, look, the problem is not uh, if we spend this money and buy this annuity, uh, we're going to be protected if she lives to 100. That's crazy. She's not going to live that long. Well, how do we know? Well, the life expectancy. No, that's just what happens on average. Our mom could live. It turns out she lived till 98. We, uh, it turned out that I insisted we buy the annuity. We bought the annuity. It was very important in, in protecting us because we were paying to support her uh, in a, an assisted living facility and uh, with AIDS. It was very expensive, uh, you know. And uh, so, <laughs> so I, you know, I, if, they, if my, if either of them get too uppity, I just refer back to that. <laughs> it's good to use over the holidays. You, yeah, you, exactly. In that case, you looked at risk management and you offloaded the, the potential risk onto somebody else. And it could have yeah. worked. Yeah. If, if we look at life expectancy, we're kind of saying it, uh, that it, we're acting as if we got like a thousand uh, lives to die. You know, we're, that it, we're not going to. So an insurance company can look at the average, can look at where people, let's say my age will die at, on average, but I can't, I'm only going to die once and it's going to, it could well be at a hundred so that I've got to look at the downside. Just like when I buy uh, a car insurance, I got to look at the catastrophic risk on average. I'm not going to total my car. Uh, so if we just looked at the averages, the average outcome, nobody would ever buy any insurance whatsoever because insurance comes with a load. There's like transactions cost. So if we just, you know, thinking about break even, nobody would buy health insurance, uh, homeowners insurance, car insurance, life insurance, nothing. Okay. So in the area of longevity, somehow uh, a lot of people think that we can play the odds, whereas in all the other contexts, everybody understands we can't play the odds. So we can't, you cannot play the odds with life with life expectancy with, with longevity risk longevity risk is probably the biggest risk we face in old age uh what are you, what, what are your thoughts on um you know we talk about delaying social and a lot of individuals with defined contribution plans iras 401ks they've built up and accumulated a lot of assets a lot of it pre-tax that will be then taxed later on when they start withdrawing from it are your, and I know every situation is different, but are you a believer in having somebody look at drawing down certain assets in their retirement years before they start collecting social? Yeah. I mean, if you, let's say you retire at 62, uh, sh um, should you take your social security money first or should you take your uh, money out of your 401, uh, out of your uh, IRA? The answer is take the money out of the IRA because on a risk adjusted basis, you get a fantastic return from Social Security and allows you a negative return these days from the IRA uh, on the IRA. Now, some of you'll say, well, gee, I don't want to take my money out of my the IRA. The stock market's been doing great guns. Uh, 
Yeah, but the stock market historically has huge volatility. So it doesn't, there's nothing that guarantees it is a random walk. There's nothing that guarantees it's going to do, do well in the future. So uh, on a risk adjusted basis, the, once you adjust for risk, the yield right now on the stock market is negative. That's what inflation index bonds are yielding right now. That's, that's the risk adjustment. You compare the average return on stocks with the return on inflation index bonds are called you know, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. They're yielding today about negative 35 basis points. Right now, you could go to the Treasury, you know, Treasury yield curve on Google it, and you'll see the real return is negative. So, but the return on Social Security is huge. Um, and it's also inflation protected. So, um, yeah, uh, take, you, you want to uh, withdraw if, you, if your cash, you know, you obviously want to time things for taxes too. You want to think about Roth conversions and uh, uh, you have to worry about your cash flow. You need enough money to, you know, sustain your living standard. If you were to just wait till 72 to take your retirement account money and wait till 70 and you're 62 and you don't have a lot of assets and maybe you're in a uh, you're kind of house poor, you're in a house with a lot of expenses, you're going to be short on cash, right? You could be pretty rich, but also, you know, you know, could have a huge amount of 401k money or IRA money. Um, and you're, you're not, you're saying, I'm not going to be able to get to it. So your tendency is to say, oh, I'm going to make a killing on the stock market because I've done well in the past. And therefore I should take my social security right away. And that's a big mistake. Uh, that's that's putting you at, because the you'll give up a huge amount of Social Security benefits, lifetime benefits, and then the stock market could crash tomorrow. And there's no guarantee it's going to come back up. Double whammy. And, yeah. and you know, we've, we've been a lot of conversations and strategies on Roth conversions over these last few years. Uh, I know your software that you've spent a lifetime of building um, really helps the individual or a planner look at the the potential benefit of the Roth conversion. You know, we look at it as yes, it's short term pain having to pay some taxes now, but what's the long term benefit? So, I know Roth conversions aren't for everybody, but would you would you recommend that if you to look at it at least and to to weigh it out and try to make for for each individual case look at it and say what's it going to help you with over the long haul. So clearly people could, you know, run our software and, and find out things precisely. But in, in this book, Money Magic, what I did is try to think about uh, different cases so that people who don't want to run software could, could have an idea about how to think about it. So one of the, the things I, I did in running cases on the program that I could talk about it in the in the book was to look at uh, somebody who's on low tax bracket. Maybe they're, you know, 64, they're retired, low tax bracket. And uh, uh, they've got some Roth money. They've got some you know, uh, traditional IRA money and they want to do, do the conversion. And what I noticed was that if they were taking Social Security early, that um, in many cases, doing the Roth conversion was a bad idea. Even though it looked like they were in a low tax bracket, when they took the money out, when they did the conversion, it kicked their, uh, it pushed their, um, modified adjusted gross income up by enough to initiate taxation of their social security benefits. So their true marginal tax bracket was much higher. It wasn't like, you know, you have to think about, uh, uh, it, it wasn't like, what's the tax on the next dollar? It was like, what's the tax on, the, on withdrawing $20,000 this year or $50,000 this year? Now, all of a sudden, I'm paying taxes on my Social Security benefits where I was not otherwise doing that. And furthermore, two years later, a year later, when I'm starting to take Medicaid, that's sorry, Medicare, now I'm going to have to pay a higher premium on Part B because of this IRMA provision. So these are the things I can worry, I warn people about in the book that, okay, if you're not taking Social Security, if you're low tax bracket, if you don't withdraw, uh, too much so that you get pushed into a high, very high tax bracket. Yeah, the Roth can make you some money. I show ex examples where it can make, you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. 
But there are other cases where it can lose you money, even though it looks like it will make you money. So this is like, you know, uh, another financial shocker that you could be in a low tax bracket and uh, relative to where you're going to be in the future and do a Roth conversion and end up actually uh, losing. From and that's I, most people don't understand how the taxation of Social Security works with the formula, although it hasn't been in, in you know, with inflation hedge. So it's really low numbers there. But that's something that really software can help them see that. And you hit it right on the head on that where, you know, it could be an additional, in a sense, 10 percent tax that they weren't counting on. Plus, uh, the the surcharges may not be if they waited till 72. Yeah, they're not going to have any. But then they look and say their RMD prior to minimum distribution plus other income that they have is going to push them over that threshold. So they're going to have Medicare or Irma, you know, surcharges for the rest of their lives. And that's a, in a sense, a penalty. It's a tax that they're not taking into an account. So many fashions, it's um, spreading out that Roth conversion and doing it in a manner where it, you know, from, from our side, it's not like 300,000 in, in two years. It's, well, what if we did 50,000 a year over the course of five years, especially with the standard deduction doubled right now. So it's, it all comes down to software though. We can't explain that to somebody visually. They, they visually have to see it. And that's where the software with a good planner can help at least make not always a hundred percent the right decision, but at least help you make the decision that probability wise is going to put you in a good, you know, the best shape that you can be in. Yeah, it is complicated. So, you know, I, I just tried to, um, in the book, since not everybody want, likes to run software, uh, explain, uh, enough cases to give people a feeling for what is best for my circumstance, but you're absolutely right. This is a very, this is, uh, financial planning is, is like, more complicated than getting to the moon. And in our software, the software, the, the actual code that we have uses uh, the same kind of technology that they use to guide a spaceship to the moon because it's something called dynamic programming. So we actually have rocket science to do personal financial planning under the hood of our software. Uh, that's what's required because there's so many factors involved here. Uh, you said Irma, Social Security, Federal taxes, state taxes, differs 42 states with taxes and another nine without, including the District of Columbia. They're, all the provisions are different. So <laughs> this is not child's play. And does your software allow an individual? Is it built? Because I've used it on the plant and on the advisor side. But if I'm an individual that doesn't have a financial planner, I'm a do it yourselfer. Is it something that I'd be able to step in and, and work without the help of somebody who's an expert or quote unquote uh, expert? Yeah, it's uh, maxify.com. It's uh, our base plan is a uh, program is $119. The, there's a premium version where you can look at your investment risk your, to your living standard. And it's all based on the economics approach to financial planning. So it's very different from conventional financial planning. Uh, you know, based on lifetime budgeting, trying to smooth your living standard, trying to raise it safely uh, with these different, you know, figuring out, is this going to save me taxes or raise my taxes? Is this going to raise my lifetime benefits? Uh, can I downsize my home and dramatically raise my living standard there? Can I untrap my equity? Uh, uh, you know, there is a zillion different things you can play with and put up different profiles and, and have fun. Uh, but again, if you're not into um, into running software, it is very easy. And we do sell it to lots and lots of individuals, thousands. Uh, but uh, we have millions, of, hundreds of millions of people in our country. So we haven't been selling it to hundreds of millions of people. Otherwise, I would be on a, on a yacht talking to you. Uh, so that's where the book comes in, Money Magic, where I would say 85% of what uh, the software is going to deliver to you, you can figure out from the book. Awesome. And well, can, the um, and you can make a lot of calculations just with arithmetic these days because the safe rate of return, the, the the real return is close to zero. So you can assume basically a zero real return and a safe return and make and make calculations just with a, a elementary school arithmetic, adding, subtracting, division, multiplication. So I could go on another two hours with you at least, but I, I know our listeners uh, may have some, some other things to do until our next episode. But, bef you know, we've gone through a lot, those, you know, the economically where we are, some of it 
quite depressing, but knowing we have to stay optimistic that we're going to hopefully come through and, and changes will be made. Um, and then sharing some tips and strategies of, of what people should be looking at, but then mistakes people are making, obviously breaking this down inside your book will, will help people gauge out a little bit of what we, you know, we just tip, uh, touched on the tip of the iceberg here, but before we end today, what would, you know, as we end, uh, 2021 into 2022, do you have any final thoughts or advice for the listeners, uh, before we, we end this year? Um, Stay safe, get vaccinated, get a booster, get three boosters if you can. I mean, really, this uh, we've got too many people dying uh, from this uh, disease, um, too many people not trusting in science. Uh, we have to we have to protect ourselves, we have to protect our kids um, and our relatives. We got to we really have to get vaccinated. Um, nobody would say I don't want to get a polio vaccine if we had polio raging in the country. And uh, thank God we have great scientists and we've developed the vaccines we've got and we'll probably have to have more uh, boosters given the variants. Uh, so that's my biggest concern really, uh, not with people's finances, but with their lives and their health. And so I wanna push people to, in this last moment, to get vaccinated. Awesome. We, uh, we appreciate that. And the uh, the time that you've spent with, with us today and the listeners, this is, uh, Wonderful, wonderful information. And, and again, it's something that it is complex. You can either do it yourself or make sure that utilizing the resources like your contributions, the what I love are your, you know, weekly and monthly, you know, ask Larry and just going down that rabbit hole of all the different questions that people, uh, a lot of it pertaining to social security, there's just great stuff listeners out there that, that you've been putting out there for years and years and years. So, you know, we appreciate in our industry, you doing what you're doing and it's helping people make better sound decisions. And that's the key. There's just so much misinformation out there. Uh, so we appreciate what you're doing there. And, uh, you know, let's, as we end, we'll hope the Fed does everything they can to uh, put us on a better track. You know, we talked about some of that earlier. Um, and listeners, let's just stay optimistic that we're going to come through this and, we're all going to be able to live the standard of life that no matter if we live to 70 or 100 or 110, that we're going to be in good shape. So, Larry, thank you for all you do. Um, all the show notes and, and a way to have access to the book when it comes in uh, uh, out on January will be available in the show notes. And uh, thanks again. We'll look forward to talking to you potentially in the next uh, few years. Happy planning, everybody. We'll be back next month with a brand new episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Happy planning. Bye-bye.